Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, I thought I would start, uh, Maddie, if you can just click to the next slide. This is one of the um, photos taken in 2018 in Louisville, Kentucky, where 3D Printing Academy for Girls was actually born. And um, every time I see the photo, it just brings me such joy. Um, I remember that evening, it was um, at the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, and several founders of, of organizations, for-profit organizations and nonprofits in the Louisville area, female founders, were being recognized as part of a program um, called WILD. And um, during WILD, I had an opportunity to present our work with 3D Printing Academy for Girls. And so I remember walking down the stage and there was music and there were all these wonderful, brilliant, intelligent women and we were high-fiving down the aisle and it just, it just brings me so much joy. So I, I thought I would share that as an introduction. Go ahead, Maddie. Like I said a little bit earlier, our work with 3D printing in education started in 2015, and it started actually on the African continent. Um, I grew up in Nigeria myself, um, grew up in an upper middle class home. My parents were uh, academicians on the university campus, and I moved to the United States in pursuit of a college education. I am not an engineer. I know many of the women that um, you may have interacted with and heard from at type today, maybe of engineering backgrounds. I'm a social entrepreneur, and I believe in impact for good worldwide. And so when I started Youth for Technology Foundation almost 20 years ago, at tw in my early 20s, I'm not going to give my age away, but really in my early 20s, uh, during my corporate career at Microsoft, I had one fundamental mission, and that was simply uh, to bridge the digital canyon that existed between the developed and developing countries using technology. In my mind, technology is an enabler. Technology is, it really should be a basic human right, right? And so when we started Youth for Technology Foundation, it was that simple. My inspiration my three daughters, ages 16, 12, and 12, who every day ask me questions like, mom, can we do science? Mom, how come they're all boys in my coding class and my technology classes? Mom, if I take this uh, mind blocks programming class, um, you know, Roblox programming class, I'm sorry, am I going to be the only girl in the class? And so really the realization that there is, um, there are these social constructs and dynamics in relation to science, technology, engineering, and math that keep lots of girls out of out of the, the the sector. And so, founding Youth for Technology Foundation, and then secondly, um, my edtech startup, which is 3D Printing Academy for Girls, really came from an inspiration from my from my three daughters. Maddie, if you go ahead and move the slides. Starting in Nigeria, where our work with 3D printing um, was born back in 2015, I remember talking with private sector partners about the power of, of 3D printing and how the industry was going to be revolutionized. And at that time, it was 2015. There were no other nonprofit organizations in Nigeria talking about 3D printing. In fact, this concept was very new. Right. I was often getting the questions from private sector partners, engineers themselves, who were saying things like, well, you know, I'm an engineer. I'm sitting at this company in Lagos, Nigeria, and I've never seen a 3D printer. And you're talking about bringing this technology uh, to peri-urban communities. How is this going to be possible? You know, the concept was just not something that was um, real indeed. And, and, and they just couldn't grasp that. Again, that was five and a half years ago. Fast forward, things have changed tremendously, right? There are other social enterprises and for-profit companies in the 3D printing space. Um, and we're so happy that we've seen that happen. But when you look at the landscape in Nigeria, our focus was particularly on young people coming out of the university. Four million students graduating each year. Um, many, many of them remain unemployed. We see that you know Nigeria has the 10th highest number of students in the world leading to, leading to study abroad. Many of them are from STEM backgrounds. 
And so we really had this vision to introduce 3D printing, especially in the schools, through our maker clubs and our maker communities um, called 3D Africa Clubs and have developed that mission um, so far where we have, uh, you know, several clubs running across seven different universities in Nigeria, really with the aim of creating a, a maker generation and shifting the mindset from made or, or rather from aid in Africa or aid to Africa to really made in Africa. And that is our mantra at 3D, at, at, uh, 3D Africa, which is a program of, of Youth for Technology Foundation. If you don't mind going ahead to change the slides, Maddie. Again, you know, just touching on the opportunity, this was an industry that we clearly saw the potential in and not just being able to inspire young people to um, to be users of technology, but really our goal was to inspire them to be makers and to be creators of this technology. Um, and so 3D printing was really a way where young people could really design and innovate the world that they envision for themselves. Maddie. What they learn, um, you know, as part of our 3D Africa clubs across Nigeria, um, they learn basic 3D, uh, 3D design, you know, using AutoCAD, of course, Autodesk is a fantastic partner. SolidWorks also is a fantastic partner of ours. Um, they also learn not just the hardware side of things, the programming side of things, and then with human-centered design, really understanding fundamentally who they're creating for. While we're doing all this, we, we really believe that to create true change makers and to enact true systems change, we can't just focus on the hard skills. We also need to empower young people to encourage them to take their power back through bringing in and equipping them with also those 21st century skills, teamwork, communication, and empathy. Go ahead, Maddie. Uh, if Maddie, since you have control of my slides, just a quick example of uh, one of the innovation accelerators that we run as part of 3D Africa. Um, it's called Hack for Good. And this is just a really short video I'd love for you to see as well. Maddie, can we have volume, please?
Hi. I'm not sure uh, why there isn't audio to the video, but um, but there is audio. It's it's on YouTube, and I'll be sure to share the link. I assume no one else can hear the audio. Okay, I'll be sure to share share the link. I'm I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure why that is the case. In any event, um, I assume everyone can hear me now, which is, is great. Um, so hack for good. I, I will be sure to share the link um, on YouTube uh, shortly after here, maybe during the Q and A section. Um, but it really is an innovation accelerator that encourages young people to really create design and innovate the world they envision for themselves. Of course, we look at several emerging technologies, but 3D printing is one that, uh, you know, we, we focus on quite a bit. And a, a huge number of young people that have come through our innovation accelerator, actually, this was the first time they had ever seen a 3D printer. We have lots and lots of success stories where young university students walk into, into Hack for Good um, and, you know, have never seen a 3D printer. They may or may not have heard heard of it, but actually get an opportunity to understand the technology and use a 3D printer to print out tangible items just during Hack for Good. Maddie, if you can just go to the next slide, that would be appreciated. And I, I know in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each of the next five slides, if, if you just go through, Maddie. Um, but these are just examples of how we take that technical um, knowledge that the young people are learning, and we encourage them to create real, tangible, sustainable products. Many of these technology products, there are components of them that are 3D printed. For instance, this is the um, road accident alert um, that actually won an award, which I'll share a little bit later, but Maddie, do you just go through? And some of the other slides um, represent some, some products. So they won Open Mic Africa, one of our student teams, um, Team Humanity, created a, a crop disease detector that um, allows farmers to detect when their tomatoes have different diseases, etc. And all these products, you know, there is an integral part of 3D printing as part of the, the manufacturing and, and entrepreneurship process. Go ahead, Maddie. I'm sorry about that. Thanks. So this is just another example also of a robotic arm manipulator. Um, part of it, of course, is, is 3D printed as well. Go ahead, Maddie. Go ahead. So those are just some examples of how, you know, our vision for the utilization of 3D printing in, in education and entrepreneurship came to being. I've seen some of the comments, which I'll address very briefly, but one of the things we learned um, in launching 3D Africa, first in Nigeria, was that, you know, we also have a U.S. office, and the, the questions were coming, well, why can't we do something similar in the U.S., right? They're developing and low-income communities where young people, especially girls, need to be inspired, Hence, uh, my founding of 3D Printing Academy for Girls, um, which is basically a, a program focused on middle school age girls, primarily between the ages of 11 to 14, which is where we see a lot of kind of the leaking pipeline is what it's called, where girls shy away from technology and drop out of um, any interest whatsoever around um, science, technology, engineering, and math. And so we really believe that uh, 3D printing had a way to empower and, and was magnetizing for these young girls to really engage and become um, inspired to use this technology in education. And so Maddie just uh, showed you, I think as part of the introduction, um, you know, our introductory uh, video about 3D Printing Academy for Girls, which is in the Russell neighborhood of Louisville, Kentucky. Go ahead, Maddie. You can go ahead. You can go ahead, Maddie. Go ahead. So, so when we really think about, you know, why we're doing this work, especially in education, um, we know that 
children even entering primary school today, like 65% of children entering primary school today are learning content that they may or may not use, right? When we think about the future of work, um, no one really knows what that future looks like, but we know that, you know, rote memorization, et cetera, does not prepare these young people for the future of work. And so our solution around this was really to create proprietary curriculum and training that does three things. One, it brings STEM to life. Secondly, it uh, sees new subcultures, particularly for girls, minority girls especially, and then it also brings the private sector into the classroom. So when we talk about the future of work and talk about the shift in the future of work, we cannot talk about that without really talking about the role that the private sector plays. And so it's very, very imperative that we bring successful women in technology from the private sector into our classrooms as mentors and or guest speakers so that, um, so that the girls can actually see what they can be in this space. Go ahead. And so these are just some examples, um, the, the slide before some examples of some of our students and some of their, their uh, you know, projects and products um, that they've created. We implement this in three ways in the U.S., through seasonal boot camps, through Saturday immersion programs and school pop-ups. And these are all integrated um, with schools in Jefferson County in Louisville. Go ahead, Maddie. Okay, and, and this slide just represents some of our partners um, that we've, we've had over the years. Of course, um, you know, I, I definitely mentioned uh, Autodesk Foundation and Autodesk as, as key partners in our work. Um, we learn, of course, a lot from women in 3D printing and, and uh, look forward to doing much more with them, especially in the education space um, in the U.S. and elsewhere. And HP is also a partner of ours. We actually designed, co-designed and co-authored um, 3D printing curriculum on HP Life. Um, and that was rolled out in 2018 and is now in, in six different languages. So please take a look. And, it, it, you know, for those that are very, um, you know, at the very age, early stages of learning about 3D printing, it might, uh, it might prove to be very valuable for you as well. Go ahead, Maddie. And I think we're, we're over our time limits right now. Sincerely apologize for the technical difficulties, but I think most of the um, fun that I actually get out of these sorts of engagements is through the interactive Q&A sessions. So with that, I'd love to open up the floor. Um, if there are any questions or thoughts or comments that you have, I'd love to be able to know what those are and to be able to explore accordingly. All right, so I'll field some of the Q&A for you, Angelica. So one of the questions that we have, it looks like, is that what were some of the challenges that you faced when introducing additive manufacturing in Africa, and how did you overcome them? I mean, some of the challenges I faced in, in, in October of 2015, talking to a senior engineer at a Fortune 500 company that we all know so well, and I wouldn't uh, talk about them in, necessarily in this forum. I mean, there was a lot of pushback, right? There is there is just no way we've heard about 3D printers, but we don't have them in country. We haven't seen them in country. How are you talking about bringing these in? The, the cost, of course, is still very high. Why would people be interested in, in this type of, of technology? And so, you know, initially there was a lot of a lot of pushback. Also, there was also a gender dynamic to that, right? So I'm, of course, a woman uh, introducing this uh, technology that seemed so foreign in 2015. It was October of 2015. And so why you? Why are you bringing this new technology? Um, you're a woman. You're, you're, you're not an engineer. Um, why should we listen to you, right? And so those were some of the hurdles that I had to overcome. Uh, but those aren't hurdles that are new by any means. So when we started Youth for Technology Foundation almost 20 years ago, those were similar comments, right? We were the only nonprofit looking at bridging that digital divide that was not related to the UN, right? And so it was new then. And so what we've learned is, you know, where there are questions, there are always solutions. And I think the most important thing for us is to be able to continue the work diligently and to be able to measure results. 
Awesome. That's great. So we have another question from Nicole Foster. And she's asking, how do you address the question of why only girls? She gets a lot of pushback for any sort of women-focused clubs or girls-focused clubs. Right. So why girls? Um, the reason we selected, you know, to focus on girls, of course, is that this historically, um, you know, girls and women have historically been um, of less focus in terms of educational programs, you know, across the world, right? And so not just with 3D printing, but just with, with educational and technology programs in general. Um, we see less and less women pursuing and or staying in, in technology-related careers um, post-graduation from university. We see fewer and fewer women actually entering the industry because they don't see what they can be. There are fewer female mentors. There are fewer successful um, female mentors in these fields. And so throughout all our programs, we definitely have made a conscious effort to take a gender gender lens, right, into all of our programs to ensuring that everyone has equal opportunity, that everyone, irrespective of who, who they are, where they are born, and to whom they are born to, um, has access to technology. Because like I said a little bit earlier, technology is a democratizer. Technology is a basic human right. It is as important as shelter, as food, and as clothing. And I know that from my personal experience, living in a peri-urban community, growing up in a developing country, and moving to the United States. There is no way young people growing up in developing countries can compete with 21st century opportunities, particularly with the stigmatization of girls and women without access to technology, okay? And so it's, it's very clear, the research has shown it. Um, you know, I'm not the only one with, with the personal experience. Others have demonstrated it, that there is a need to focus on, on girls and women and focus on them actively in order for us to meet the, the sustainable development goals. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Angelica.